right, Unit 3, Module 2, San Francisco. But first off, what is a hippie? Is it a positive thing or is it a negative thing to be called? Well, I guess it depends on your point of view. The media today kind of shows these mostly distorted negative images of the 60s, and it was the same back then. Media images of parodies of dirty, lazy, spaced out, drugged out, overdoses, civil rights, protests gone wrong, extreme expressions of, of uh, this, that, and the other. Yeah. Well, in reality, this is a stereotype, just like any other stereotype. Not every hippie used drugs or didn't shower. And, uh, you know, does the media still distort things that we talk about in images and music today? Yeah, probably, yeah, in a lot of ways. Um, well, let's talk about the birth of the counterculture a little bit. San Francisco wants a culture for this new, uh, new the culture center for this new counterculture center. And basically, the civil rights movement going on here, the Cuban Missile Crisis, if you haven't studied that, you know, basically we came pretty close to having a nuclear war going on. And of course, increasing troops in Vietnam, and all this stuff had an effect on what's going on in society. Kennedy's New Frontier and Johnson's Great Society uh, rhetoric kind of soars for many, and race riots are going on in, in pretty much every major city at some point. And young people start to question the conservatives of their parents' generation. And this new theme emergency, emergency, you know, question authority. And basically, you start questioning various things. So they would, would basically uh, work on little things like uh, try new philosophies, uh, want to try new ideas, experiment with different religions, some of the, uh, some of the Eastern religions, uh, transcendental meditation, commune living, uh, new social values for equal rights, free speech, movement, uh, drugs, uh, sexuality was questioned. Um, at one point, LSD was legal, then they make it illegal. And there's a very famous episode of Dragnet that uh, basically Joe Friday, you know, makes LSD illegal, illegal and gets to go bust the hippies at the end of it. So I, I, I think you can find it online somewhere, and maybe, uh, or we have, or they show it reruns every once in a while. And they kind of need to see how the media kind of distorts the, what the, the hippies are at that, that point there in 1967. Music as a philosophy. Um, experimentation is a very big part of music in San Francisco. San Francisco is a port city. And with port cities, you get all these people that come in and out, and some would stay, some would go, and they, they bring in what they know from one area to another, and, and all port cities are kind of like that. And San Francisco definitely had this, where all these different peoples from all over the country and the world uh, would settle down. And they, they also, uh, folk music and blues music was a big focus of the San Francisco sound. Uh, and as well as jazz, and as, as well as some of the countries, such as some African Indian classical music. Just like we heard with the Beatles, uh, they were influenced by all the scene as well. Well, uh, if you listen to the Fifth Dimension's Aquarius, Let the Sun Shine In, uh, 1969, uh, basically you can kind of hear some of these things going on. You know, what is this philosophy, the age of Aquarius? Where is this coming from? And basically, this theme emerges that questions assumptions and authorities uh, that are built on positive or changes the negative. And they have, again, this openness to the new ideas are there as well. Uh, they they kind of recognize music, folk, folk area music, and blues music, and also the classical music, and they weren't uh, averse to trying some avant garde techniques as well. Uh, in there. And, and the, the open mind of the rock audiences there were, were really led along with this. That you could have somebody doing this, and uh, you know, country Joe McDonald's avant-garde Space Jam, and Otis Redding uh, soulful music, and psychedelic rock going on, and blues, rock, and Jimi Hendrix and the Who going on, at, like at the Monterey um, uh, Pop Festival. All these things can go on and, and go on at the same time, and the audiences, you know, were happy happy to to, to be there for that. But what do you know about the '60s? Well, the media today shows these distorted images. Of this and in a lot of ways, this uh, subculture kind of was reinventing itself uh, by this point here. So in San Francisco, uh, Bill Graham pops to mind as as a person that promoted these big rock events going on. And Tom Donahue starts something on radio. He's a DJ and an FM. At this time, AM was the main radio station for popular music, and FM was kind of like the internet of today. Basically, you'd hear bands that you, you would never hear anywhere else. So if you listen to FM, you knew of Jimi Hendrix. Uh, if you listen to AM, you may have never heard of Jimi Hendrix. 
uh, and you might have heard of some of the Motown groups, but you might not have heard of you know some of the other uh, soulful groups if you, if you didn't listen to FM. So FM was kind of this thing, and and he comes up with this something that's called album-oriented rock. Basically, that's where DJs would decide what were the hits. They would listen to a record and think, all right, this was a good tune. I'm gonna play this instead of having somebody tell them, well, play this single here. So Tom Donahue does that with his album-oriented rock, and has, and has a big influence. FM radio, as well. It's a big deal with that. Well, let's go on to, to some of the bands from San Francisco. Uh, Jefferson Airplane pops up as one that to think about is definitely. They were probably the first major, they were pretty much the first major San Francisco act to get signed uh, from a major label. And coming back to me, if you listen to that tune by Jefferson Airplane, it, it shows this folk revival going on, acoustic instruments, reflective lyrics, personal. Now we get to somebody to love. And this is a little bit more familiar sound, more rocking. You hear Grace Slick as, a, as the lead vocals going on. And if you notice, we haven't talked about a lot of women in rock and roll yet. And finally now in the 60s, we're getting to the point where, we're, where women are rocking out now. And we, we're talking about them. Uh, definitely more loose, electric, rocking, uh, somebody to love the song. Uh, a collective effort as well as going on. And, and, the, and the bands, were, a lot of times they would live together, they would work together, they would, they would promote their, their records together, they would promote their concerts together. Uh, basically all working, making collective decisions. There wasn't one clear leader a lot of times in these bands. They were all making decisions together. And White Rabbit's another one, a good example of this Jefferson Airplane, psychedelic type sounds going on uh, were there as well. Well, a happening, I kind of like talking about what a happening is. Basically a happening at this time was where it would be a theme. So you get a lot of artsy people together, musicians, artists, dancers, uh, poets, writers, and you get them all together in a room, and a lot of times it would be a theme, so you might dress a certain way, and kind of just wait to see what happens with all these artsy people. And sometimes nothing would happen, and sometimes something really cool happening. A happening that you probably heard of is the Magical Mystery Tour, that bus trip with the Beatles, and that was one of the first flops the Beatles kind of had. They got all these weird people together, and nothing happened. It was like, okay, well, well, big deal. What happened? Nothing, really. Um, so that's kind of what a happening is. It's really cool. You do some research on this. It's really fascinating. Grateful Dead, and this definitely is a San Francisco band, and no fans are more loyal to a band than the Grateful than the Deadheads. Basically, I, I, that kind of my mind, I see like a VW bus, and basically you're, you're selling some beads or some food. They get enough gas money and ticket money to go to the next place that the Grateful Dead will plan. And they were known for their live shows, you know, like long, long, long uh, versions of their, of, their, of, their, of their music. And also they encouraged their uh, audiences to uh, record the music and share the music with, the, with their fans. So you have all this, this uh, music of the Grateful Dead and these live, incredible shows. Check out uh, Cold Rain and Snow by the Grateful Dead. This is 67. And here are the sounds uh, in there. Another good example of the Grateful Dead is the music never stopped, and this is 1975. And the thing about the Grateful Dead was that they could go from one style to another, and their fans you know, let them find where they were at, and, and, and their fans were searching for these magical moments of this improvisation going on. So they wouldn't play the same thing over and over again. They might even play the same set list going from night to night as well. Uh, Casey Jones, of course, another great tune if you haven't heard that before. And you know this band is really tight because they play all these long concerts. They can, they can read each other, and that's one thing that that, uh, that you can tell when I go when I go see a band live. I know what's going on by if they actually practice or not, or they're practicing in front of me there, uh, because I, you can just tell a band is tight. It's really really there. Janis Joplin, a fellow Texan, born in Port Arthur, Texas, uh, hitchhiked to San Francisco and then back. And Joy's joined up with a group, this Big Brother and the Holding Company. Um, she had this incredible bluesy, powerful sound, and and just just so so powerful. So check out uh, Mercedes Benz, which we we listened to before as an example of, of monophonic music. Piece of my heart is probably my favorite Janis Joplin song, Baby, Baby, Baby. And in there, you can hear a lot of ways. This is soulful music, right? This is this is soulful music. A lot of emotional singing coming out. Janice doesn't hold back much, and sadly, she's the first member of the 27 Club that we'll talk about. She uh, died at the age of 27 of a, of a heroin overdose, and, and so forth. Uh, some other San Francisco groups, uh, 
Conjuring Joe McDonald, The Big Fish, Fixing the Die Rag is a good one. Uh, the Steve Miller Band, Living in the USA, uh, Santana, Evil Ways, uh, Queen's Queer Rider Revival, Susie Q, uh, Sly and the Family Stone, Dance to the Music, so you kind of have a, a really diverse music going on in San Francisco. And that's what part of the San Francisco sound. It's not just one sound. You got blues, you got folk, you got soulful, all coming together. You got some psychedelic, you got some more electronics, you got some distortion going on, um, long extending solos. So these are some elements of this. San Francisco music. Well, in 1967, it was a, known as the Summer of Love, and basically the scene kind of unravels in San Francisco. Crime and drugs and racial tension took their toll on the city. City governments banned live performances in the Panhandle District. Uh, the Hyatt neighborhood focused a lot on drugs and eating for free and free music, and people just kind of dropped out of everything altogether. Uh, Woodstock, um, August the, uh, 15th to the 18th, 1969, was this really powerful uh, movement and basically really positive experience for a lot of folks. About a half a million people went there and re probably regarded as, as the biggest pivotal movement in rock and roll history. And there's a list of, of folks, you can go find that on the internet, of all that played there. And it, it, it's just it's pretty amazing and that was a really peaceful ways. And for a lot of people they thought Woodstock was the beginning of the movement, but really in a lot of ways that was kind of the end of the movement at that point there. If you go to study the Doors, we're getting down to some of the L.A. bands that still has some characteristic of the, of the San Francisco bands. So uh, we definitely tell with the Doors that blues music is a big part of their uh, repertoire. Jim Morrison was really uh, a poet, really kind of had this bizarre persona that he would go on, and his lyrics reflect that. And in a lot of ways, it's, it's really kind of minimalistic, his lyrics, and, and as well as the music, really repetitive of this dark sound that goes on. An example would be The Doors, uh, A Break On Through, uh, People Are Strange, another great tune that you can go through there and, and read the lyrics and see what's going on uh, with this music. And sadly, uh, Jim Morrison was another one that uh, died, at, died at 27 again. Um, he, he moves to Paris to, to uh, devote himself to the written word and dies of a heart attack in a bathtub in 71. And probably a good little quote that he said, uh, I'm interested in anything about revolt, disorder, chaos, especially activity that has no meaning. It seems to me to be the road to freedom, and this was Jim Morrison. Now, Jimi Hendrix, of course, when you think about rock and roll music, you almost automatically think of Jimi Hendrix in a lot of ways. He played that Stratocaster guitar left-handed, like Paul McCartney felt more comfortable that way. He could play both ways, but uh, definitely felt more comfortable playing left-handed. and. He was an example of somebody that couldn't get a record contract in America. Uh, so his advice was, give, it was given to him, go to Britain, and Britain, their guitar nuts. They love the guitar. And they got over there, and the Who, the Rolling Stones, the Beatles, all went out and heard Jimi Hendrix play. He's like, wow. Who is this tornado who just came into town? His name is Jimi Hendrix. And he was able to put together a band in uh, Europe, in England, and uh, you know, Purple Haze, a great example that, that comes out uh, of that. You can hear that distortion, and you can definitely hear the blues influence in there as well. Uh, and a lot of his music is so natural that comes out of him. Uh, along the Watchtower uh, is a cover of Bob Dylan's, and you might want to listen to Bob Dylan's original uh, version of the song and listen to Jimmy's cover of it. And uh, one quote that Bob Dylan said, uh, I don't know why, uh, uh, it's a wonder to me that he, he recorded it's not a wonder to me why he recorded my songs, but rather why he didn't record. He recorded so few because they were all his. So I think he felt really inspired by that. Um, anyways, so we got the three. They got the members of the Twenty Seven Club, the three J's: uh, Jimmy, Janice, and Jimmy. Um, Jimmy, Janice, and Jim all died in the ten months of each other at Twenty Seven, and that's the members of the Twenty Seven Club. And kind of the end of an area, uh, Nixon becomes president, and. Uh, and then uh, the Charles Manson monstrosities go on. The Altamont race track, um, you know, again with the Hells Angels uh, killing a member of the audience there. And then with all the deaths uh, you know, with, with the rock stars. And, and then Kent State, of course, where the National Guard, uh, uh, four students killed and 11 were wounded by the uh, National Guard over there in, 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 in Kent State University. So uh, pretty much the you know, what started off as kind of this peace love movement went to this very violent one towards the end. Rock and roll.